Just a quick one before we get into this episode. If you're in the UK and you use supplements, I'd highly recommend checking out Reflex Nutrition, where they're giving up to 40% on all their range if you use the code PTRNT at checkout. I've been using Reflex for nearly a decade, with their microwave being one of my favorite whey proteins. It's grass-fed, hormone-free, and digests so well compared to most on the market. Check out their full supplement range, including your, all your transformation basics and plant-based alternatives on reflexnutrition.com and use the code PTRNT at checkout for up to 40% off. It's not long left now until the new book, Transform Your Body, Transform Your Life is released. Sunday 24th of May is the big day and I can't wait for you to get your copy. Make sure you subscribe to our email list and social media for updates on book bonuses, previews, competitions and giveaways. Exciting times ahead. Today is my third solo podcast and it's dedicated to my new book, Transform Your Body, Transform Your Life. With just over a month to go till its release, I wanted to record an episode to discuss my why behind writing it and the journey of writing the book so far. It was a fun co- podcast to record that allowed me to reflect on what's been one hell of a ride over the past six to seven months. I'm super excited to release the book on May 24th and I can't wait for you to all read it. So without further ado, let's dive into this solo podcast 3.0. So I believe this is my third solo podcast and t- this one today is one I've been wanting to record uh, for probably about six months now and it's all about the book. Uh, as of today, it's March 31st, this will probably be coming out in a couple of weeks so we're just under eight weeks now till the book launch and to say I'm excited is an understatement which is why today I want to record the podcast about why I've written this book and what may be more interesting is how I've written the book. So throughout the journey of writing the book, I've documented uh, what I've done, what I've thought, how it's all been, what I do differently. Uh, and ex- and I want to spend time on this podcast today discussing that exact journey. And what I've done uh, as you'll come on to is I've actually spoken about it in the five phases, because as you know, the five phases has parallels to every industry, every every endeavor, any every project you go on. And writing this book was no different. So I want to start by talking about the why. And but before we do that, I want to talk about the trigger because at the start of any transformation journey, there's always a trigger, as you know. And in in the in the realm of body transformation, it's typically your clothes not fitting right. Uh, some pictures you've seen of yourself, uh, a comment, etc. So there's always a trigger that then gets you to think about your why. For me, my trigger was actually during the photo shoot prep uh, for my photo shoot prep of summer 2019. So I was uh, I had a photo shoot at the start of September, and I remember being three to four weeks out. I was doing a cardio session, uh, and then it just it just hit me. Uh, I was like, I need to write this book. And this year is 2020 and 2020 marks 10 years as a coach. It's 10 years since I first had the idea of writing a book one day. And to see it come to fruition now is, is a very special moment. And one I know it wouldn't be possible without the incredible support team I have around me. So this book, Transform Your Body, Transform Your Life, is not only my creation. While I was the one who wrote it, there were so many people that poured their experiences into it, their feedback, uh, their their wisdom, their guidance, their accountability. So there's so much, so so much to be thankful for. And uh, when you get a copy of the book, I've saved a whole section on this in the acknowledgements. Um, So in brief, I don't want to take up too much time. Thank you, people. In brief, um, I'd like to thank my publishing team at Rethink Press, all the test readers, all my team at RNT, all of our clients, uh, and my family. And without the support, guidance, and feedback along the way, it, this wouldn't be possible. So, anyone who thinks writing a book is a solo endeavor, think again. It's a team sport, just like uh, running a business is a team sport. Just like going through a transformation journey to team sport, this is no different. And writing writing uh, this first book of mine, 
it's been one of a one hell of a ride and I want to I want to dig into more about the why because there's three different whys I have it's uh, a personal why it's a company why and there's an industry why behind it as well so there's three levels to this why and to begin with I want to discuss the personal why so ever, ever since I discovered the joy and flow of writing I wanted to write a book and I remember saying to my parents about 10 years ago and even to some friends of mine I said I'd love to have a book in my hands by the time I'm 30 and to get this uh, a little bit earlier is a uh, is a nice feeling and I've started a few books over the years uh, at different points about four years ago I started a cooking book uh, it had different recipes and it was all about how to how to cook healthy um, healthy meals that fit your uh, fit your macros, fit your lifestyle. Nothing groundbreaking, nothing um, that was unique or personified about what I believed it, believed in uh, within this genre. So I didn't really pursue it because it just didn't grip me, and it didn't feel like a message that needed to be out there because it's been done so many times, and. While at some point I probably will have uh, some form of recipe or cookbook, I don't think this was this was meant to be my first one, um, nor the one that really got the message out there for us. So I didn't really feel the the need to get out there. Uh, and the second one actually was uh, when I started within a year of starting within a year of uh, launching R and T. It was a book about body transformation, but it was done in a way that didn't separate us in the way that we can now do at the moment. And what I mean by that is I hadn't formalized the five phases yet. I hadn't formalized our specific methodology. So it didn't feel like a book that was worthy of RNT, nor a book that allowed me to inject my own personality into it. So it, did, it just didn't grip me. And there, there were two books I started and quickly finished. Um, uh, by finish, I mean put to the wayside, saved to the draft, uh, and, and something I'll come back to later in the future. But this book was different. And I remember I remember the moment distinctly. I was halfway through a brutal cardio session. It was a few weeks before my photo shoot. This was an unplugged cardio session as well. So no headphones, no music, no stimulation. And I remember my, I, I just had ideas flowing like crazy. Uh, and... I was thinking about the next challenge after the shoot was over because for that three month period, the, the main focus and priority was on getting absolutely shredded. And the only, I only had one answer. It just kept popping up my, in my head all the time. Write the book, write the book, write the book. At the time I was thinking, what's the book? <laughs> what book? And, but what I kept hearing in my head was write the book. And I, it was just strange because my subconscious must have known that this was the time to to do it. This was the time to formalize my ideas into a book. And a few days later on 4th of August, I started a journal entry with all I can think about right now is writing the book. And so I remember going off the grid uh, a few days after that. And it was actually where I recorded my first solo podcast uh, when I was, uh, I think it was in the Chilton Hills. And I recorded my first solo podcast there and I was deep in the grind. And during that, uh, during that time off the grid, I spent some more time journaling about this next challenge and planning out what was going to happen after the shoot. And I set myself the challenge for the final quarter to be, to write the first draft of the book. And at the time I was, I was well into my uh, goal of trying to visit 12 countries in 12 months. And I thought, let me try and tie in this book writing with another country to visit. So I started, I started looking at different locations and I realized I hadn't been to Vietnam yet in Southeast Asia. So I thought, uh, let me go find a, re a remote, obscure location in Vietnam, lock myself away, get, get go off the grid, find a place in the hills. Uh, you know, as, as the, the cliched uh, writing, writer, writer story where they take themselves to a remote cabin and just write for days on end. 
But then the shoot happened and I traveled to the US for around two weeks and the appeal for traveling beyond 10 trips uh, that year just fizzled out. And all I wanted to do at the moment, at that, at that time, was just write. So I'll discuss the structure of my writing afterwards and how I approached it, but I decided to stop traveling after the Kenya trip at the beginning of November. Uh, and I used the final quarter to really hammer down the book. And when I was thinking about the different topics, um, it, it was simple. I mean, if it came naturally, early in 2019, we'd finally formalized the five phases of the R&T transformation journey. And we'd done it to a level, a level we'd not done before. Uh, I remember distinctly, pretty much exactly a year ago, uh, I was with Nathan in Sorrento and we were we were mapping it out while on a drive around the uh, the the town of Sorrento and Amalfi Coast and Pompeii. And we were driving around and we were talking about the five phases and and how we can formalize it a bit more, how we can detail it, how we can make it clear. And we were drawing sketches of the, the graph and uh, all throughout that trip. And even if you look at the, the five phases graph, if you look at the background, you'll see there's mountains, uh, which I think there's about five different mountains in a silhouette. And th that mountain... Uh, came, actually came from, we actually took that picture from the top of our hike and it was one of the best hikes I've done. I think it was called Path of the Gods, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, Nathan. Uh, so yeah, we took the picture on the hike and we really formalized the uh, the methodology there. And we had so much, there's so much to discuss, discover and dive into for each phase. Writing the, the blueprint of this, the journey that every transformation goes through in any industry, all in one place, was exciting. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized just how important this was. Uh, and it quickly changed from a nice milestone to achieve, as in writing the book, to a book that I must write, a book that our industry, our genre, uh, our, our audience, they need. Uh, and that completely changed uh, the game for me. And ultimately, now that I'm in the process of almost publishing the book, Transform Your Body, Transform Your Life was written to mark the start of a paradigm shift, which then takes me on to the next part of my why, which is linked to our industry. And if you consider the biggest problem we face in the health and fitness industry, it's the quick fix, short-term mentality geared towards only being in the shape of your life. And then that's why you see four-week blitzes, eight-week shape-ups, 12-week plans all over the place, every single day, new ones coming out. And it really is... And the more I wrote the book, the more I realized just how big of an issue this is. Because while these plans can produce great results in the short term, what about the long term? What are you supposed to do once you get into shape? How can you translate a short-term train, a short-term change into a long-term transformation? And that's where this book comes in. It's been written, it's been written to teach you how to not only get into the shape of your life, but learn how to stay there and continue to improve long term. And it goes deep into the mindset, behavior, identity shifts that need to occur in order to facil facilitate that uh, translation from a short-term change into a long-term transformation. That's the surface level industry why. If I go deeper now and think about my why behind my why, it links very closely to my experiences in bodybuilding and as a personal trainer. And when I reflect on my career as a personal trainer, it's a tale of two parts. Uh, when I started coaching in 2010, all I ever cared about was helping people get into the best shape possible. And that pretty much remained until 2014 after competing in my first bodybuilding show where I felt the highs of being in the shape of your life. But very quickly, the lows of rebounding, yo-yoing and ruining all of your hard work in a very short space of time. And this stung hard. And it triggered a lot of reflection and introspection as to why it happened. It took me a long time to get back on track. Uh, for a year, I pretty much, for a year, pretty much, uh, I suffered with binge eating, yo-yoing, uh, putting on weight very quickly, and then mini dieting to get it all back off. It was a very difficult year for my body confidence, for my body image for my control of my body, the, the, the mind and the role of the mind. I, I realized the, the role of the mind in, in all of this. So it's a very difficult year, but once I got myself 
uh, back on track, things changed. And this 2014 experience made me realize that all I ever cared about was the process of getting into the shape, getting into shape. So getting to the top of the mountain, but never thinking about what came next, how to tra- and how to translate what I, what you achieve in the short term to a long term transformation. Uh, and the analogy we always talk about is getting to the top of the mountain. How do you take a safe passage home and then plan for the next route and the next mountain so you can maintain the tenacity, the fitness, the shape that you had, and then improve on it thereafter, which is really the hard bit and and where I believe the journey truly begins. So this was a light bulb moment in my career. And once I did get myself back on track in 2015, I started paying attention to the differences between those who get into shape and those who stay in shape. And I learned how it was never really about the diet plan, the training program, or the supplement protocol. In the first five years of my career, that's what I cared about. And if you've heard some of the podcasts with Sham and with Dinil, you'll know that I love to experiment on all sorts of things around diet, training, supplements. It's all I really cared about. It's what I was reading about. Um, And it works great for a short-term change, but for a long-term transformation, it needed to go deeper. And I learned that being lean and healthy for life meant a fundamental internal re- fundamental internal rewiring. Because you can't only change what you put in your mouth or how you train. You need to shift your entire identity, behavior, and mindset. You need to live by rules. And it becomes more than just the physical. Ultimately, you need to think and act differently. And this realization was the birth of what we now call and what we now know as uh, as the five phases of the RNT transformation journey, which is ultimately a step by step approach to enable you to get into the shape of your life for life. So, on reflection, this 2014 moment was the tr- was the trigger to change my approach, thought process, and coaching method. It sparked the formulation of the five phases. And in the in the past three years since starting RNT, they've gone from being loose phases to a crystallized fail-proof methodology. And if you follow it step by step, it's impossible to go wrong. And that's why as soon as the idea and the seed was planted to write a book, there was only one topic I wanted to write about, and it was the five phases. Because I don't want anyone to make the same mistakes I made for years, both in myself and in my clients. So that was the birth of um, the the book and and why I wanted to write it from an industry point of view. Because yes, I want it to be a guide for all of our clients who who are on the journey and to be an extra set of extra source of knowledge for them to have with them while they're working with their coach. But at the same time, I wanted it to be accessible to People are all people in in um, all over the industry, all all within the industry in different parts, uh, and and even for those who who want to utilize the five phases uh, approach to a different industry, because there's a section in this in this book where I talk about the parallels, and again, the more I wrote, the more I got into writing the book, and the more I read it, because I'll probably by now, if anyone who's who's written a book, they'll know that you have to, you end up reading it hundreds of times just to check it for editing, spelling, grammar, sense checking, structure. There's so many different parts to it that you end up reading it hundreds of times. And by the end, you're completely blinded by it. But the more I read it, the more I realized that this was a, this was a methodology that can be applied to anything you're trying to build and improve. So I'd like to think that this book can be a source of uh, knowledge for anyone trying to improve and ultimately embark on a path of self mastery, and that's the underlying um, aspect of the book. Which brings me on to the next part of my why, which is that this book is part of our mission. Which, for those of you who've not heard before, our mission at RNT is to help regular busy people use the physical as the vehicle to transform their lives, and. For anyone who goes through the five phases, 
The benefits experienced always transcend the physical. And so this book is very much part of this mission that we're on. And it, it fits very nicely into our coaching process, into our content that we put out on a day-to-day -day basis. And it just adds an extra arm to the strength of our mission, which is why, which is why it, it, suddenly, it became a book that would be nice to write to something that I needed to write and needed to get out there for, for you all to read. And one of the pieces of feedback I got uh, from one of our test readers was that he said that the, this book, even if you're in phase four, say you're in a deep investment phase, the lessons you learn on the book just transcend across everything. And it allows you to sharpen your sword and go back and reflect in a way that I've not been able to convey before in our content or in our podcasts which is why this book is, is really going to push this mission to another level. So we know the benefits transcend the physical uh, and by mastering your body, rewiring your behavior, identity and mindset, you're going to be more confident, more focused, more in control. You're going to feel, look and perform your best. You no longer have to worry about endless dieting, rebounding, yo-yoing, and the way the real magic is, is you begin to push yourself to do more in all areas of your life, whether it's relationships, your career, uh, and all aspects of your health. And when I reflect on the last 10 years, or uh, well, the first 10 years of uh, my time in this industry, which is also a special milestone to be able to release this book on, these benefits that transcend the physical are all that I've experienced um, both in myself and through the, the work with our clients. And the, the mission of the physical is the vehicle was born 10 years ago without realizing it when I first started picking up weights and, and seeing the, the impact that it, get, it put in my life. But it's only grown and strengthened and really come to light uh, as the decade has progressed. So... This book is, is part of the mission. It's written to act as the perfect guide along the journey. It's going to question your actions, your thought processes, and unlock a whole new level of self-awareness. And with the underlying message and the underlying drive of the book to take you a step closer to self-mastery. So when these three whys click together, this book became more than only about me. I, I write on a day-to-day -day basis to satisfy my creative appetite. But what I've learned in the last couple of months is whilst it satisfies my, while it's, whilst it's satisfy, satisfying my own appetite, the real reason for my day-to-day -day writing is to serve as a vehicle to transform others. And finding this sweet spot between satisfying my own creative appetite and being able to use it as a vehicle to transform others has never been easier than when writing this book. You know, I've been able to stay in huge amounts of flow uh, and get that tingling feeling that many people, if you've experienced flow and you've experienced the, the magic of being in flow, you'll notice that your, your feet are tingling, you hear a small humming sound uh, in between your ears and you're completely oblivious to everything that goes around you in the world. And writing this book has allowed me to stay in flow for extended periods of time, whilst also knowing that I'm, it's serving a bigger purpose. And finding this intersection has been really uh, the driver for allowing me to get this book done uh, in, in a relatively quick and fast period. And it's going to help our clients understand and derive even more benefit from the journey. There's... There's multiple, yeah, there's multiple wives to this book. Uh, it's it's going to help our clients. It's going to share with the industry that we work with and there's a paradigm shift happening and that getting into shape is not enough and it's not only about training, nutrition and, and supplements. And it, there's a reason why I actually didn't include anything to do with training, nutrition or supplements in this book. 
There's no training plan. There's no nutrition plan because that's been done a million times before. And that's actually the easy bit. The hard bit is how to execute and make it happen in the real world and then allow what you achieve to last for a long period of time. So the next part of this podcast is all about how this happened, how this unraveled. And this was a really enjoyable task to dive into. I I spent some time looking over some of my notes folders, some of my spreadsheets, looking at my Trello board, and thinking about how the trigger moment I had in uh, August 2019 during my cardio session led to uh, me discovering my three whys, but then ultimately led to writing a book. This is one thing to come up with an idea of writing a book. It's another thing actually writing it, editing it, and, and putting it out there for publishing. Because as, as you know, ideas are, ideas are, are everywhere. Execution is everything. So I wanted to just dive into how I took the idea into, uh, into a book. And the way I'm going to tell it is, is, is there only one way possible? Uh, it's through the five phases. So let's start right at the beginning. We've got Lane it in uh, before before phase one. You've got the period where you lay the foundations and you put in the initial groundwork, just like in any transformation. Because without a strong underpinning, you won't be able to survive the highs and lows uh, of of the transformation journey you're going on. And when there's when I talk about highs and lows of writing a book, there's a lot of highs when you're living in that flow state period, but there's a lot of lows when you're burnt out, exhausted, and you can't read another line of your own writing anymore. So I need to lay a foundation. And the first bit is always connecting to your why and your why behind your why, which I've already discussed um, in this podcast. The second is to set short and long-term goals. So my short-term goal was to reach my first checkpoint of finishing the first draft by Christmas. The long-term goal was twofold. The first was to publish the book by 24th of May, 2020, which coincides with our three-year anniversary at RNC. And the second was for the published book to serve as a continuous guide for years to come with those on their own transformation journey. So you could probably break that down into short, medium, and long-term goals. With a long-term goal not being tangible uh, in effect, but more uh, more impact-driven. Uh, than a tangible, measurable goal. Of course, to be able to take uh, massive action, you need accountability. And to maximize accountability, you need to have all three levels, uh, self-accountability, peer-level accountability, and coach accountability. And writing this book was no different. So I had my self-accountability come from my personal goal of publishing my book, uh, publishing a book, uh, my greater why, and the challenge I'd set myself. Something uh, a, lot, a lot of people ask is, what is my why for, uh, my personal why, and for, for business, for training, and even for writing on a day-to-day basis? And they're all the same. It's all about self-mastery. It's all about improving myself, giving myself a new challenge, and using business, training, or writing as a vehicle to improve myself and learn more about who I am, what I thrive off and how I can get better. And ultimately the self accountability generated from writing this book was no different. To create a peer level accountability, I simply told everyone I knew that I was writing a book and it was being released on May 24th. So I put it on social media, I told all our clients and I've I've been very vocal about writing this whole book. And one of the key reasons is to keep myself accountable to everyone, keep myself uh, accountable to my peers and added another layer of accountability, which works. Um, and it allows you to create massive action. If you're setting yourself deadlines and you tell the world, you're going to get things done. And the third level was country accountability, which is my publishing team at Rethink Press. Uh, so after telling them that my goals they broke it down into bite-sized chunks with hard deadlines to reach each phase and their expertise and years in the publishing game and all that I've, I've needed to do was create. I've not had to worry about formatting, typesetting, printing, 
anything to do with the logistics of publishing, which is something that from right from the outset, I didn't want to have the headache to deal with. Um, and the only magic rule that they told me was that as long as I did my bit and met the, met the deadlines, the blueprint that they have for publishing a book was easy to follow. And so far I can attest to that in that it's been seamless, um, but the accountability of having those deadlines given by the professionals has been uh, priceless. So once we've laid the foundations, it then goes on to, you then go into phase one, which is cleaning the palette. And cleaning the palette of the book has been, um, clear, was been about planning the book. So if I look back now, uh, my CTP phase lasted about three months. It began in August, 2019, when I first became obsessed with the idea of writing a book. And I had a notes folder uh, open called in capital letters book uh, that I'd, br I'd brained up into on a daily basis. I'd also do, I was also doing a lot of journaling and I used the time from August to October in 2019 to detail what, what I wanted to talk about in, in what structure, what message, and what was the outcome that I really wanted to do. And the problem was, is that I just began to overthink it and I was stuck in paralysis by analysis because I had too many ideas. There's too many things I wanted to talk about and I wasn't sure how this could all be formalized into one book. So when I signed with my uh, publishing team in September, I decided to do a book planning day and this was a game changer because, well, firstly, it was one of the most intense days I can remember and I was in a flow I was in a flow state for the entire day like I was in my completely in my element um, and the goal of the day was simple was to leave the room at the end of the day with uh, a skeleton of the book uh, a table of contents and a plan on how to take it from the first word right through to submitting a manuscript for professional editing it was uh, nine to five it was in an office in Victoria, uh, in South London, and it was just yeah an intense day, but I was in complete flow. And along with my mentor, uh, Shiban, uh, we began to download 10 years of coaching insight onto small, uh, colorful post-it notes. So as I was speaking, as I was speaking about the book, Shiban would make uh, different post-it notes She'd write on the personal notes, uh, organize them, and then we discuss it, uh, move them around, see what the structure, see what structure worked, and step by step, uh, chapter chapter by chapter, everything started to come together. It was actually a really cool exercise because what she did was she just provoked me with questions and coached, essentially coached the entire book out of my head and onto these post-it notes, and it gave me the first of my three S's structure because all the jumbled thoughts in my head that I had from before had now been organized into a clear table of contents. And now I just needed to lock in my strategy and system to be able to execute and ultimately just write. Um, so the questions I had to ask myself now when it came to the next uh, two of my three S's was how was I gonna write, uh, how was I gonna write this book? What if life got in the way? What if business trained all of my time? What if I was too busy? So the answers lied in my CTP accelerators. Uh, the first step was to make uh, a non-negotiable commitment to myself to write every day. I needed to adopt the identity of a writer. I needed to become a writer. Uh, it's something I've been, that identity I've been exploring a lot this year because I've joined um, a creator's workshop hosted by Seth Godin and it's dedicated to improving your creative craft and the aspect and then one of the, and the core fundamental aspect of the workshop is that you show up every day with something creative. So you have to create something every single day. For me, my chosen uh, form of creativity has been writing. And as a result, I've written something every single day uh, in the, the months so far that I've been on this workshop. But what it's done is it's changed my outlook on writing from something I just do to something I am, uh, something I've become. 
to become a writer uh, in this process. And that was the first step in, in writing this book is I needed to make a non-negotiable commitment to the goal of writing. And it meant showing up no matter what. And I set myself a goal of a thousand words a day. And the commitment was much smaller than that. The commitment was to open up Microsoft Word every day and to just write 200 crappy words a day and see what happens. With the idea being letting 200 words, 200 crappy words turn into a thousand and then let the power of accountability, a big deadline and my why to carry me across the line in time. As I've uh, explored this creative workshop I'm, I'm on right now, which granted a lot of it has come since, right, since after writing the book, the, the fundamental message here is that of the workshop is they talk a lot about being a professional and what it means to be a professional. I know this is going on for a bit of a tangent here, but I want to discuss what I've learned that it is to become a professional. And on this workshop, we've been talking a lot about what separates a professional from an amateur, what separates a master of their craft to a hack or someone who just treats it as a hobby. And one of the biggest commonalities in true professionals is the art of showing up every day, even when you don't feel like it. And the, the second part of that sentence is critically important because there's a big difference in showing up when you feel great and all the chips are in line. There's a whole different, uh, a whole different task to show up when you feel like crap, things in your life are, going, are not going well, You've got every excuse in the book to not, not turn up, but you still turn up. And making that commitment to be a professional in my craft has, has really helped with the identity shift of becoming a writer, but also has highlighted uh, one thing which underpins a lot of successful journeys in business, in body transformation, in, and in writing the book, and that's uh, ruthless consistency. And it's something I'll talk about later on as part of the three keys to uh, three keys to creating something. And, and one of them is ruthless consistency. And the commitment to making to commitment to writing 200 crappy words a day can be carried over to anything in any craft you do. It's it's simply the art of showing up. It's the art of uh, doing the minimal viable activity that will that can that has the potential to propel you into doing a lot more and it's this commitment that was the cornerstone for me uh, in writing this book the second was to limit decision fatigue and that's where spending time crystallizing the action plan generating with generated with Shaban was was important as well as setting my environment up for success so if i break those two into parts the first was to look at that table of contents and think, okay, I know I know what I'm gonna write when. I don't need to wake up and think, okay, what am I gonna write today? It's very clear. It's just follow follow the step by step blueprint and just wake up and execute. The second was around the environment, and for me, this was around wearing the same clothes every day, the same music for writing, the same writing seat, the same time stop of writing. I kept all the variables the same. So I didn't have to ask, should I write on the armchair or the sofa? Should I play classical or trance music? Should I write at 6 a.m. or 9 a.m.? I kept everything the same. So uh, the way, I'll explain in a second how I set it up. Um, but to, to, to fulfill, uh, stumbling my words there, to fulfill my non-negotiable commitment, I chose to write every morning. Uh, for me, this is my most productive time. It's my magic time. It's where I get a lot of productive work done. And it's where I'm, most, I'm my most creative. So to make it as seamless as possible, I then uh, set up my precursors, which is the third CCP accelerator uh, for my days and weeks. And this is the way I did it. So at the start of the week, I'd note down the key content that needed to be written. The night before uh, each, each writing morning, I would open up on Word what I planned to write uh, with a few notes on each. And then in the morning, I'd go through this simple routine of brushing my teeth. I wake up, brush my teeth, put on my gym t-shirt, hoodie and tracksuit bottoms, which 
the reason for that would be, uh, firstly, it was the same thing I wear every day, but secondly, it's also a precursor to going to the gym after my writing session. So I put on the uh, the same t-shirt, hoodie, and tracksuit bottoms, walk downstairs, drink a mix of lemon and sea salt with water, walk to the corner sofa, walk to the corner sofa with my laptop bag, open up a bag, open up the bag, pull out my journal, journal for five to, five to 20 minutes, and then open up my laptop, open up iTunes and play the same song I always write to, which is uh, Chopin uh, Nocturne's uh, number one in B flat minor, which for me is my ultimate writing and creative song. As soon as I press play on that song, I just go into this immediate tunnel vision to focus. Uh, it's pretty crazy actually. And I highly recommend anyone for anywhere, everyone really uh, in, in whatever craft that you're doing to find that one song or to find that one beat that just puts you into that tunnel vision. Uh, because for me, uh, playing Chopin just in, in, immediately puts me into it. So open up a laptop, uh, play Chopin, and then just start writing. And, and that was it. I mean, the routines and habits stacked on top of each other there all made execution simple. And it just primed me uh, for the next phase, uh, which is writing the first draft, which then, so let's discuss um, phase two now. So phase two, the process phase, uh, and I'm calling I'm calling it the sprint to the first draft, because once I got my three S's locked in place uh, of my structure, strategy, and systems for writing the book, that's always the hardest bit. Uh, laying the foundation, doing all the introspective work you need to create the underpinning is is always the hardest. So once that was done. Uh, I began, I began writing and um, it ended up being a sprint once I got over the first hurdle and the hardest bit was actually writing the introduction at the beginning because I hadn't, I hadn't, while I knew what the skeleton of the book was, I didn't really know what the, the in-depth content was. So I still hadn't, I, I knew what I was writing, but I couldn't picture it. So it was hard to introduce it. And, and looking back, uh, I would definitely do the introduction at the end. Uh, and funnily enough, after submitting my manuscript at the end of January, the first piece of feedback within hours, I sent, I sent the email and within hours, I got an email back saying, I need to rewrite the introduction. So I'll discuss that later on when I come on to uh, the editing process. But for now, in the process phase, the goal, once I got past the introduction was 200 crappy words a day. Um, so I started at the beginning of October, or no, sorry, mid, mid October I started. Uh, with the goal to write my first draft by the start of, start of December. And what ended up happening was I wound up writing 42,000 words in 21 days, which was timed with the end of October. And uh, way ahead of deadline. And what ended up happening was I wrote daily for two hours at a time and just cranked through all. And I built up momentum really fast. And I think I pretty much stayed in that gather momentum stage for a long period of time and carried it through all the way to my first checkpoint. And the timing worked out perfectly because I had a, I had a trip to Kenya booked uh, early November where I was delivering a seminar talking all about the five phases. And having just vomited 42,000 words all about the five phases, in detail, I'd never written about before. I was more prepped to present this seminar than ever before. I remember being at the, uh, at the, at the start of the seminar and I was thinking, I haven't really looked over these slides. Um, I haven't really prepared much. And then I was like, well, actually, I've just spent three weeks preparing in the best way I could, knowing these five phases inside out uh, in more structure, clarity, than ever before. So the, the preparation was actually perfect. Um, and this period of time was uh, very much phase three consolidation, which you know, there was a break from writing. It was the first review uh, of the book and uh, my first improvement of the book. So once I got back from, uh, sorry, let, let's just backtrack a bit. Kenya came just after I'd written the 42,000 words. And then what I'd, uh, one thing I rethink really they talk about is the, the process of writing your first manuscript as an acronym uh, called writer. So 
W-R-I-T-E-R. And it stands for Write, Review, Improve, Test, Edit, Repeat. And looking back now, it's a flawless blueprint. But what happened is once I'd finished the 42,000 words just before Kenya, it quickly dawned on me that writing, 30, writing the first 42,000 words meant I was only on stage one. So the hard work had yet to be done, had yet to actually begin. <laughs> and uh, that was definitely a humbling thought and reminds me of the exact same feeling of getting into the shape of your life and then thinking, okay, how do I keep this now? So it's very similar in that the hard work begins after you reach your first checkpoint. So what I used Kenya uh, as was a time to take off writing. I actually printed off my first draft and took it with me to review while I was out in the safari park uh, for a few days after the seminar. But it was, it was when I was in Kenya that I realized just how burnt I was from the writing. Like doing 42,000 words in 21 days is no joke. And while at the time I was in my flow, I don't think I realized just how much it took it out of me. Uh, because when I was there, I just couldn't look at the manuscript. I couldn't, I couldn't face the idea of reviewing it all. I had, it, I had a few times where okay, I was gonna read it on the plane, I was gonna read it uh, on the porch when we overlooked the, the savannah. I was gonna read on the plane back. I didn't do any of it. I just couldn't face it. So I decided to consolidate my thoughts and wait a few weeks. And it was lucky that I was ahead of schedule because it gave me some really welcome time off uh, the book in all aspects. Once I got back from uh, Kenya, I continued the break. And in the middle of November, I decided to go again. Um, I first went through hit, hit the process of, of um, the next, the next stage was review. So what I did is I went, I went through the book as a reader uh, with the rule being I wasn't allowed to edit. I had just had to read the book as I was a, an outside reader. And I made some notes uh, at the end of each chapter, but the main goal here was just to check for flow, sense and structure. Like was, was this a book that I'd be happy to put in someone's hands? Once I'd read it as a, as a reader, then I, then I went into editing mode and I first, and I, had to try and improve this draft. So that was the next step of the writer process. And this was actually way harder than writing it. And I didn't expect this at all. And because on, on the way to the first checkpoint, all I did was write. Um, I didn't think about reviewing, checking or editing. I didn't want to do anything that halted my creativity or halted my flow. So the goal was just to write and ultimately vomit the words onto the page. This stage of the, the writer process was the first time that I had an opportunity to uh, review it. And I'm glad I left it to this point because there was, a lot to, there was a lot to do. I had a lot of missing case studies. There was a lot of repetition, uh, a lot of gaps, and a lot of poor chapter structure. In my head, basically, this was a mess. And it was time to go back to the drawing board. And it was actually at this time that I made uh, unplugged walks a daily habit. And I discovered why so many other great writers, philosophers and thinkers uh, would go on long stretches of walking uh, every single day and would they make it non-negotiable. And I use this time to mull over my thoughts, solve some of the structural problems of the book and decide on the specific improvements that needed to be made here. So... My unplugged walks would be done around 9 a.m. So I'd, I'd write or improve the book for a couple of hours when I wake up. And then I'd go on my unplugged walk, which would take me to the gym. So my unplugged walk would always be before the gym. And I remember during the training sessions that, that followed these, these walks, I'd, I'd have some of the best ideas for the book. And I just had a constant, um, I had my notes folder constantly open during training. And in between sets, I'd like jot down notes and ideas would come uh, at, at the times I least expected. Sometimes I'd, I'd be doing a set of chin-ups and something, something would just pop in my head like, oh, I need to include that in the book. So it's funny how if you listen to my episode with Shane O'Mara, we talk about how when you're, when you're walking and when you're doing uh, activity, physical activity that doesn't require too much thought, you, you begin to unlock the creative 
powers in your brain. And there's definitely something to be said for that, for that. And this process of writing and implementing the unplugged walks during the improvement phase can definitely back some of those suggestions. So highly recommended uh, if you don't do it already as a way to solve problems, think about deeper, uh, deeper strategy uh, and in any way that uh, can be applied to your life. So yeah, highly recommended to add into your day-to-day routine. So by the time I uh, reviewed and improved my first draft, I was uh, near 50,000 words. Um, so the book had expanded quite a bit in these weeks, but I was now ready to give this book to be give this book to others, and I was happy with what has now been that was now formed as uh, the first draft of the book. Which then takes us on to the next phase, phase four, investment. And the investment phase of this book journey is all about the editing process and turning a first draft into something that's ready to be published. And uh, this, looking back, hands down, is the hardest phase uh, you'll, you'll go through in the book and makes writing the actual writing bit uh, a piece of cake. So... I had the first draft ready for the first week of December and sending over the first draft to my initial group of test readers was daunting. I kept asking myself, uh, would they like any of it? Uh, Was it still a mess? Uh, Did the book make sense? Uh, I had all these doubts swimming around my head, but at the same time, I was very excited because what what if this book had potential to be good? And that was, that was an exciting prospect. So I wanted to know what people thought of the book um, on the first read. So on December the 9th, I sent out the email and gave everyone a hard deadline of Boxing Day uh, to turn it around by. And this gave me, this was then give me Christmas and between Christmas and New Year's to review the feedback and begin the editing process. And the feedback overall was, was overall very constructive, very positive, uh, with a lot of great points raised, um, many of which I'd not thought of. And my rule was, um, if two people mentioned something, it needed to change. If one person mentioned it, then I think about it and, and take a, take a strategic, uh, viewpoint on it. But if two people or more mentioned it, it was something I was probably going to change. Uh, so what I did is I gathered all the feedback into a Google document and I began to work through everything point by point. And the key areas of improvement centered around uh, the structure of each chapter and the, the potential to thread one of the chapters of the book into the others instead of giving it a standalone. So this meant uh, ultimately changing the last chapter and deciding whether to scrap it overall or whether it should be uh, threaded throughout. I decided to thread it throughout. And this meant there was a lot of work to be done because I had to restructure each chapter and consider blending in another one into each of them. So this is a, this is a big one, um, a big task. And I kicked off the 2020s by diving straight into it, uh, starting with the big structural problems to be tackled. And then and then tackling the smaller details. And I found reorganizing each chapter to be very difficult. It was um, it required a lot of capacity, a lot of bandwidth. And I spent a lot of time during my unplugged walks and my training sessions thinking about, okay, can it be, can it, can it go flow this way? Can it flow that way? Should this go first? Should that go at the end? But it really added a level of professionalism to the book that was sorely missing. And it was, near, it was now clear what format each chapter should be delivered in. Um, and then I asked myself, why wasn't I, be able, why wasn't I able to do this after the book planning day? But what I didn't appreciate is once you start writing, the ideas begin to flow like crazy and you begin to think of new ideas. Uh, you dig out old concepts you've not thought of for years and you start adding bits to the plan and the skeleton plan that requires an adapted new structure. So what I did was I printed out my initial table of contents again and 
audited it very closely and I asked myself these questions. What is absolute success for each chapter? What does a reader need to know? What case studies are necessary for each section? Where is the bloat, repetition and excess? Uh, what needs more clarity? Does the chapter flow within itself and, and to the next? And I kept asking, my, asking myself these questions and I wrote, I, I uh, annotated the, the table of contents page with all the notes I need to, all the things I need to change, um, what needs to move where, uh, and how uh, the best structure could be applied for this. Uh, so I spent the the first few weeks of the the new decade solving these problems before putting together another group of test readers, and I included a few of the same test readers from round one, uh, especially the ones whose feedback fundamentally changed the structure of the book. Uh, because there were a few that the feedback was gold and I am super appreciative to the people that took the time to read this book and uh, give me feedback on it because some of it was absolute gold and allowed me to turn what I thought was an okay first draft into a really solid one. Uh, this by the time I was able to give it to a second time, um, second group of uh, readers. And this time I had less doubt. I wasn't thinking, is it good? Is it, it are they going to enjoy it? Because for me, the manuscript was transformed now and I was excited to hear back. And I gave people a 10 day turnaround uh, to give the feedback on the book before uh, I, had, I then had two weeks till uh, the deadline. And these two weeks were sheer brutality. I mean, I've talked about, I've spoken about the riding the red line of burnout multiple times. <laughs> but just coming off it by taking some extra rest and extra sleep. But this time there was no time for a break because I had two weeks to turn uh, the latest draft into the best possible manuscript for the professional editors. I had no time for a break. I had to literally wobble my way through these two weeks to meet the deadline. I was probably in these two weeks, I was probably the most productive I've ever been, but at the same time, the most exhausted uh, and for seven days straight, I had all the symptoms that I usually get. So sweaty palms, achy legs, dehydration on a daily basis. Um, but at this point I just had to push through it because the next checkpoint of submission was so close and I just couldn't miss the deadline uh, in order to meet, re reach the overall deadline of being able to publish on May 24th. So. Armed with the latest feedback, I got to work on the, the book. This time overall though, the, the feedback was much shorter. Uh, the, the hard work of the first edit and the first round of test readers really paid off and the structure was now spot on. It just needed fine tuning. So things like grammar, uh, sentence, a couple sentence structures, changes, um, sense checking, uh, clarity, uh, a little bit of repetition. So similar things to what the first test route, uh, first group of test readers uh, mentioned, but on a much smaller scale um, with only a few things actually need, that needed to be changed. So what I did was amend all the suggested feedback. And then I started a line, line started a line by line edit of the manuscript. So the, the suggested feedback was uh, done in in about a day or so, but the line by line edit was something I probably didn't need to do, but I wanted to do because I wanted to hand my publishers the best possible first manuscript, and this meant leaving no stone unturned. And in this line by line edit of the manuscript, I had a checklist by my side. I'm going to read it out just for uh, interest purposes, because I think it, it really took me back to my uh, my English lesson days. I felt well, I felt like I was in a I felt like I was in an English lesson this whole time because I kept uh, by my side a list of tips that I'd accumulated from different articles talking about self editing, and uh, there were 16 points. So I read it out here: number one, watch out for adverbs; number two, split long sentences into two in most cases. Number three, replace negative not sentences with positive. Number four, don't say the same thing twice in two words. Number five, never say in order to. Number six, watch out for start to. Number seven, delete very or really. 
Number eight, uh, use stronger verbs and ditch adverbs. Number nine, use the active versus the passive voice. So for example, RNC had published the blog, would be a passive voice. So it would be uh, active voice. And uh, passive voice was blog post was published by RNC. So it's trying to stay in the active voice as much as possible was um, the goal. Number 10, get rid of there are or there is or this is at the start of sentences. Number 11, watch out for anything that ends in ing. Number 12, uh, that doesn't take a comma, but which does. Number 13, over versus more than. I think that was all about um, knowing when to use which. Uh, number 14, uh, look out for that. Uh, so on this checklist, I just had that in inverted commas as something to look out for. Number 15, give the reader credit. And number 16, look out for slightly, rather, or a bit, and which basically means you need to be more assured rather than using those sorts of uh, those sorts of words. So I kept this uh, checklist by my side and, and after I'd gone through the whole manuscript, I used control find on Word and I typed in all of these, these phrases to make sure that none of them appeared because apparently these are big editing pet peeves, which I probably use in my articles uh, on a regular basis. And I know I've said it loads in podcasts, but for a, which is fine in a conversational tone, but for a book, uh, I realized that there needed to be a, another level of professionalism and another level of uh, formality that uh, require these nuances to be uh, ironed out. So this process took a few days. And then while I was reading about how to self-edit your manuscript, there was another tip that constantly came up. And I would say this is the biggest game changer for, for, for anyone looking to write anything, is read your manuscript out loud. This was brilliant advice and I felt uh, if the above made me feel like I was in an English lesson, this made me feel right back at school again. Um, you know, when, you're, when your uh, English teacher asks you to read a segment from the book that you're studying as a, as a class uh, and you go around the room reading different parts of the, the, the book, this made me feel uh, like I was taken back in time a bit. Um, but what reading, reading out loud really helped is it made sure that the grammar and the flow was on point. And I actually spoke a lot of it out to, to my dad, um, which was another game changer in itself because speaking out loud to someone else makes being clear even more important. You can't fumble your words if you're speaking to someone and you have them right in front of you. So that added another layer of um, accountability to the process uh, as well as um, clarity as well because of what I was doing uh, as I was reading sentences I would edit edit them straight after if there was an issue and I also use at the same time um, something called the Hemingway editor and I just use this sparingly to allow myself to um, spot glaring weaknesses and overuse of passive, passive voice or adverbs two nightmares for editors. So that was a useful app that I combined into this process. And after a few days, uh, my throat was gone. I was completely sick of the manuscript. I was reading it out loud, a couple sentences, I'd spot something was wrong, I'd go back and edit it, then I'd read it out loud again, check, and then I'd read it out loud again. Uh, so my, yeah, I was completely sick of it. And by this point, my eyes were constantly twitching. I had bags, I was exhausted. And I just needed to sleep, but all I could hear in my head at this time were the following. What point am I making? Is it necessary? Is it clear? Is it as simple as possible? Is it as short as possible? Did I leave anything out? And it was these constant questions that I was asking myself through the editing process that I just couldn't, I couldn't get out of my head. And it was all I was thinking about is, can I make this as clear as possible? And that's what really separates writing an article and uh, just the, the simple process of writing compared to editing in that editing requires a lot more brain, uh, brain power and um, bandwidth and mental energy units compared to just uh, writing. So if I um, think back to this, this period of, um, of editing, 
I remember deadline when deadline day came and uh, submitting submitting it to rethink. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm gonna email rethink. I'm gonna email my publishers now, and then I'm just gonna have an early night and I take the whole weekend off. So I sent the email. A couple hours later, so I went to train straight after the email. Come out, came back. A couple hours later, and the first feedback was, I have to rewrite my introduction. <laughs> And I'm laughing because my heart sank. The weekend off I had planned was completely cancelled because I needed to nail this introduction. So I set off on a long walk, uh, unplugged walk, to think about the feedback, how to fix it. Essentially, the, the feedback was that the introduction wasn't doing the job an introduction was doing. It wasn't introducing the concepts well enough. And it yeah, it didn't introduce the concept, if that makes sense. Um, so I needed to nail this and I needed to get it done quick. So I went for a long walk, journaled some ideas, walked more, trained, wrote notes on my phone, slept uh, a bit more. And then Monday morning, I sat down and cranked it out. And I decided to ask some of the test feeders some, some feedback on it. First response was, do it again. Second response uh, after doing it on Tuesday was, you can do it better. And then Wednesday morning arrived and I got the response I was after, which was send it to rethink. and. Yeah, I was so relieved and it was time to sleep. So that was uh, definitely a spanner in the works that I didn't see coming. But looking back, I would definitely do the introduction at the end uh, of the book. So I was able to, so I'm able to introduce the concepts in the best way possible. During this uh, seven day period of writing the red line, I was, uh, I was looking, uh, as I was, as I was thinking about this, this seven day stretch, I was looking back at my journal entries from this period and when I was reading them, they sounded like I was in the, the deep, dark, dark uh, period of the Vigela grind, uh, as you would be during a, a fat loss phase. And some of the stuff I was saying, I was just like, I need this week to be over. I need to hit this deadline. I can't wait for this deadline to come. I can't wait to sleep afterwards. I'm so exhausted. Like these common things I kept uh, writing down. But on, after I'd submitted it, on the Saturday, the 1st of February, I wrote, uh, I wrote the following about um, submitting the manuscript and the final bits of editing. And I wrote, I can't say it was always enjoyable, but I had a sense of suffering and liberation from it that I've not yet experienced since going through the grind. Lots of similarities between them in how you feel. The essentialist in me is coming out in full effect. If you've listened to my first solo podcast, you'll know that one of the reasons why I like to push myself to the absolute limit and often take myself towards that red line is because I enjoy that orchestrated suffering that comes from being in the grind and I gain a sense of liberation from it. It's funny, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll speak to my family and say, uh, you know, am I doing the right thing? Am I, uh, do I just need to take a break? Uh, am I built for this? All, all of that, all, all of those usual sort of questions. And the response I always get is the same. It's, it's you know, this is, you actually enjoy this. You've got a sixth sense of enjoyment from feeling, uh, feeling like you're in the grind, feeling like you're, you're suffering, quote unquote, um, through, through this. And at the time, I'm always like, I always uh, deny it. But when I look back, it's so true. And I, I do get a sick sense of enjoyment from um, orchestrated suffering. And there is a sense of liberation that I gain from putting myself through uh, hard stretches of, of work, of, uh, of conditioning, or whatever it may be. So, and at the same time, when I'm in this grind phase, I always learn uh, the essentialist in me is coming out. And I remember at the start of January, there was a couple of speaking gigs that uh, I was potentially getting involved with for the end of Jan. And Pooja told me to clear my whole calendar for January, especially in the final two weeks and not to include anything. And at the time I was like, I don't, I don't you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> sure, I'm saying this. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you, uh, I, 
I, I can do both. I can edit the book and I can do these speaking arrangements, etc. And I got to the end of the month and I, I remember telling her, I'm so glad you told me to, to keep that uh, calendar free because there was no way I'd be able to speak in front of a crowd uh, the way I'm feeling right now. So big shout out there. Uh, but the, the, the underlying message there is that the essentialist uh, always comes out during the grind. And this writing this book was no different in that. I had to really prioritize my energy, uh, my mental energy units, my bandwidth, and my um, different projects I had on, on the go. So uh, another always important spring cleaning lesson that you can only get through uh, the grind. Once I submitted uh, the manuscript for professional edit, it was time to land on a title. Now, up to this point, I had not actually, I didn't know what the book was called. Uh, I knew I had to convey something about the journey, but I struggled to put it down and to nail it down. I had a Trello board open throughout the writing process to jot down ideas. And when I gave the copy to test readers, I went through a few different iterations. I had the physical is the vehicle. I had the RNT transformation manual. I had the five phase solution. I had the transformation journey, but none of them were sticking. Uh, and what ended up happening is I had a call with my publishing team to discuss it. And an hour later, it all came together. And while throwing out different names, name, con name combinations with the word transform, we landed on transform your body, transform your life. As soon as it rang out, I knew we found the one uh, because it encapsulates everything that this journey is about in that you, you transform your body and in the process, you transform your life with the underlying mission uh, being the uh, of RNT being the physical is the vehicle, which is one of my title ideas. But uh, we decided that the physical is the vehicle while, while it's a great mission statement and a great reason for um, doing what we do. It doesn't quite have a ring of a title mainly because it's not clear on what it does. Um, it might not be clear to uh, on the outset, whereas transforming body, transform your life. It's very clear what it does. You know, by transforming your body, you transform your life. You use the physical as a vehicle to transform your life. Uh, so as soon as it ringed out, I knew we'd find the one. And then uh, Joe, the head designer at Rethink, um, also the co-founder, he turned, ended up turning the, the title into a beautiful front cover. And he gave me different iterations, uh, one with an interspersed layout uh, and one with the the title and the subtitle master your mind and body to be in the shape of your life for life with the for life being in bold blue and one with the uh, the for life being white underlined and so and to get the to find sorry to to decide on the the one i i like most i sent it to my family friends and team and it was a close call between the two um two without the interspersed layout and for those of you struggling to understand why I mean my interspersed layout, which I know I'm not being very clear on it, and it's probably hard to encapsulate it on a podcast, but if you just go to the show notes article I've linked here with this podcast, um, which discusses this journey of the book, along with some pictures in it, you'll be able to see the four different uh, front cover choices that we had. Uh, and it was definitely a close call between them, but the one we ended up going with, uh, which you'll see, uh, on the cover of this this podcast that was definitely is definitely uh, my favorite one now so a couple weeks later um i received uh the feedback from the professional edit and the first thing i realized is that all the hard work editing the manuscript as much as i could before a professional eye was put onto the, the the book was absolutely worth it because the feedback was solid i was ha and i was happy that there was no structural changes that were needed at all I could deal with uh, grammar changes and creating consistency and tightening uh, the flow and word count here and there, but structural changes are what really drives uh, a lot of bandwidth. And I'm glad I took the time after the first readership to be able to nail that structure. So that was time well spent. And what I actually planned for after this, uh, after this professional edit was 14 days of editing brutality again. Uh, so this is actually a welcome surprise. Uh, but in typical fashion, I became obsessed. And what I did was I read the, ended up reading the book five times in five days. So the entire book front to back in five times, uh, in five days. Uh, and the reason why was after the third read, 
my laptop crashed <laughs> and uh, the document itself was fine. But I, I just couldn't take any chances and I couldn't risk not knowing that there might be a certain area that needs to be changed. So I did two more, write, two more reads just to double check. And each time I read it, I just thought it was worse than the previous time. And at this point, I was just completely blinded, blinded by it. And I needed to just respond to my comments and uh, submit the entry. And uh, now I await to see what happens. Um, phase five, the reward phase is yet to come. The, the reward phase will come on May 24th when RNT turns three years old and I get to achieve this 10 year pipe dream of mine. Uh, all I have now to do is a final proofread, which will happen in the middle of April when this podcast is released. Uh, but in the meantime, the team at Rethink are working hard to typeset, format, and prepare the book all for publishing. And when I, when they sent me uh, the typesetting example of what the book's looking like, I, I just couldn't believe it, uh, how, how good it looked. And I started quite, I started to, um, I started to think about what would a good entry to the reward phase look like for me. And my answer that I kept coming up with was that if our clients can use this as a second guide along the journey, it's a job well done. If they can take the teachings to amplify everything their coach is saying, I'll be happy. Ultimately, I wrote this book for three reasons. And if all three can be accomplished, I know it's mission accomplished. And that's what a good uh, reward phase for me will look like uh, come May 24th and beyond. To... um. To finish this uh, this podcast, I want to go through. Uh, I know I know I've broached an hour. I've, I've gone over an hour now, and um, what I want to do to finish off is, is discuss what worked well and what I do differently. And this was a good reflection task that I did uh, a couple of weeks ago, when just after submitting the the manuscript uh, for final entry. In our transformation scorecard, we talk about the three, if you haven't, and by the way, if you haven't taken the test, make sure you head to www.rtfitness.com forward slash scorecard uh, to score yourself on the three keys to success, commitment, consistency, and coachability. And if I, if I reflect on the past six months, those three keys have been uh, my strengths uh, in the process. You know, I committed to making this book a number one priority uh, in my life, which has been the key driver in the speed of this process. And what I've done is I've changed uh, my magic time in the morning from business development to book, book, uh, to book writing, book editing, book marketing. The whole process is now dedicated to uh, the book. And for many weeks at a time, there was nothing else I did but write the book in the morning, which has been a massive commitment. And sometimes, at, at some points, it's been scary because I've had to put business development on hold in order to write the book, which, you know, in many cases could be seen as business development, but this was very much thinking long-term and big picture thinking that uh, meant the, the day to day had to be put on hold in order for the longer term picture, which is a lesson in itself and, and one which I'm, I'm very glad that I did. Following on from this, um, I spoke earlier about being ruthlessly consistent and this was critical in moving the needle forward on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, every day I'd write either 200 crappy words, I'd edit a few paragraphs, I'd think about a few more ideas and it was just being consistent throughout the process. The third is coachability. So I wouldn't be able to do this without coaching at every stage of the journey, right from a book planning day with Shaban to the different test, uh, test reader groups, uh, and and to the editors. So learning to embrace feedback, both good and bad, has been a skill I've honed even further in the past six months. Um, because I've had sections of the book completely torn apart. I've had to kill my babies multiple times. Um, but through this, I've had to keep a coachable, growth-oriented mindset while continuously checking my ego at the door and staying neutral in the presence of feedback to acknowledge it and then action it accordingly. And that's been a, a, a real lesson and, and journey in itself. Other few things that uh, is worth noting on that worked really well that, I'm, that I'll take forward next time is the book planning day. Uh, I'll definitely do that again. And I recommend anyone who wants to write a book to do one as well. 
Even if you do it alone, just lock yourself in a room with no electronics and just download everything in your head onto a piece of paper and you'll be surprised of the clarity you experience. Um, if you can have someone who can coach you, this, coach you through this process and pick at your brain, that's even better. But if you can just lock yourself away and download everything on your brain, that in itself is gonna be a huge, um, a huge asset to the process. The second thing that worked, um, that also worked really well was having deadlines of each milestone and checkpoint from the beginning and sharing them with your, uh, sharing them with my peers and, and with my coaches, which, which then brings me on to the next point, which is tying in all three levels of accountability. I think if you're trying to achieve uh, success or progress or improvement in any area of your life, having all three levels of accountability locked in is a critical part of it. The other thing was, uh, looking back, uh, which was really good, was actually getting the first draft of the book done as quickly as possible so I could get the real hard work of editing underway because I understood, I completely underestimated the bandwidth and brain power required for editing. And in terms of mental energy unit value, so MEU value, edi editing ranks high, high on the scale. And I wasn't prepared uh, to feel like I'd done an entire day's work in two to three hours of editing. Very humbling process indeed. Which then brings me on to uh, what I would do differently. And one which I've already mentioned is writing the introduction last. Uh, so I, I still remember it took me about a week to write a page of my introduction and then everything just flowed after that. Um, because what I did is I started the introduction, then I started a bit of the book and then each day I'd add a bit more to the introduction. But instead of racking my brains on how to start the book, if I just saved it to the end, I would have known much more easily how to introduce, uh, what I did. And funnily enough, this is how I do my podcast. You know, I always record the podcast and then after the podcast, I'll then write the introduction to it because then I'll know what was actually spoken about, what was discussed and, and how it unraveled. So that was a good lesson. Uh, the second was uh, to flesh out each chapter in more detail. So while I had a strong skeleton to write from, what I didn't plan for was specific case studies, the examples, and some of the nitty gritty, which would have saved a lot of time and energy when it came to those sections. Um, what I found it when I was writing this book that I'd get to a point where I'd wrote insert case study and then I have to think about, okay, which case study do I use here? There's so many to go from, which part of their story is most relevant. And, and I think I should have done this uh, at the beginning as opposed to during the writing process, just to speed up some of the, or speed up and keep myself in flow for longer periods of time. Third one is, is to add more breaks into the process. So I had this, uh, with Kenya, but after that, there was no real break in the editing timeline, which I think would have helped me keep a step him more sane. Uh, so next time, I definitely would have stretched out the the deadlines to have a later editing deadline. But for the purpose of this one, with my goal of trying to publish on twenty fourth of May, uh, there was no real room for maneuver here. Uh, and the last one, which comes from the area which I had to do most work on from the feedback is looking at creating, creating a consistent chapter structure from the beginning. This would have saved a lot of work after the first uh, test reader, um, but what it, once it was put into place, the book came to life, uh, which hopefully you'll be able to see when you grab your copy in a month's time. Uh, and that say, I'd also link this to potentially veering off track from the initial table of contents created. Uh, which is why I had to go back and audit it after the first um, first feedback round. So looking uh, using the table of contents that we come up with in the book planning day, just fleshing out a bit more uh, with the examples and making sure that the chapter structure is consistently kept through as I'm writing the first draft would make a big difference. So those are the lessons I'll take on to uh, when I come to writing uh, the next book, which is uh, ties on nicely to the end of this podcast, which I want to discuss is what's next. Um, the question I always ask myself, and you know, writing has, no, has been no writing a book has been no easy task at all. But would I do it again? Absolutely. Uh, it's been the best thing I've ever done to download my brain, formalize my learnings, and flesh out the RNT blueprint into one place. You know, the five phases are now more organized, structured 
and detailed than ever before. And I have no doubt it's going to accelerate our clients' journeys to a new level. So looking ahead, I've already opened up a Google document with a sketch of the next book, and I'm not going to give it away right now, but the aim of the book will be to transform the world, not transform the world. The aim of the book will be to transform the way the world thinks about coaching. Um, and that's going to be the, the crux of the, the next book, which uh, I will begin planning and sketching out in more depth after Transforming Body, Transforming Life uh, comes out in a month's time. Uh, but before I recycle this journey again and take all my learnings and put it into a new challenge of writing another book, I plan to soak this one up as much as possible. One of the things I spoke about uh, at the end of 2019 was being able to celebrate the small wins. And I'm trying as much as I can during this process of, uh, of writing this book uh, right from the outset all the way to publishing to soak up each stage of the journey uh, as much as possible and enjoy it uh, for what it's worth. And while at the moment in the world, we've got the, the, the coronavirus pandemic, which may put a halt to the book launch parties in London on Saturday, 23rd of May and in New York on Wednesday, 27th of May, uh, there, I will try to endeavor to celebrate it in another fashion, whether it's a virtual, uh, a virtual launch party or similar, uh, if those dates can't go ahead uh, due to the coronavirus uh, quarantine recommendations. So I'll keep you posted on how I plan to do the launch parties if they don't go ahead. Fingers crossed, things change very quickly, but it's looking unlikely at the moment. Um, but we will celebrate it in some, some way or fashion. Thanks for listening to today's uh, solo podcast and I hope you've enjoyed the, going through this journey of the book as much as I have. It's been nice to reminisce on the past six to seven months and go through right from what was the trigger during a cardio session all the way to what's soon to be uh, my first published book. So Transforming Your Body, Transform Your Life is out on May 24th, 2020 on Amazon and Kindle. And I really appreciate all of your support so far in bringing this book to life and uh, getting it to publish. Stay tuned and I look forward to releasing the book. Thank you so much for being here today on this episode of RNT Fitness Radio. I'd love for you to do a quick little favor for us. Please head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating, leave a comment and share it with your family and friends. If you're interested in learning more about how to transform your body and positively change your life, go to www.rntfitness.com and explore all our free content on offer. Thank you.